it's another bright day in spite of all the snow that's fallen around us. And uh, we take this opportunity to say, Jesus, thank you for snow and for the grace that we have with you. For our friends and those who have been following us, we began a series last week or about two weeks ago and that we titled Pursuit, the Pursuit of God and His Purposes. I will simply say that we came to the conclusion that the only way a person can successfully pursue God is to know God. And that's where the exercise of uh, the pursuit of God is. You know, when I uh, meditate on this topic, one of the things that often come to my mind is a, an effort that somebody puts in thinking that they are doing the will of God. And at the end of it all, the Lord himself said, you know what? Everything you did is iniquity. I do not, I never knew you. And I just imagined how disappointing and how heart-wrenching or how devastating it will be to show up before the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, thinking you spend a lifetime serving him, living for him, and he's saying, I never knew you. It is a terrible thing. Uh, this week, I was uh, watching a, uh, a documentary of uh, people who adopted children, and the adoption went crazy. And uh, one of the things that came to light is that a lot of the adoptees or those who adopted these children thought they were doing a good job. And suddenly, by the testimonies of the adopted children, they realized that those kids never even appreciated what they did. And observing them, I could just see hearts that were broken, hearts that were disappointed. Now, that's a whole different story. That can be solved if you want to. But when we move that up to the level of God, the Lord of the Lord of Lord and the King of King himself, and the answer that we get from everything that we thought we were doing, and he say, I never knew you. It's actually, he's not even saying you did something. He's not even acknowledged that you did something. He's basically saying, I don't know you. So whatever you did has no value in my economy. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, if we are pursuing God and his purposes, we probably need to be careful and to make sure that we know the God that we are truly pursuing and whose purposes we are trying to satisfy. So I will call to this topic, Introduction to Knowing God. And, and here we're gonna use uh, the books of Jeremiah and Revelations. We're not going to read all, uh, but let's read Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. It's so clear here. It says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts Boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in this I delight the declares the Lord. I mean, this is like a powerful package here. God is saying that if a person is going to even boast at all, let it be because they know me and they understand my purposes. Isn't that so easy to see there? Let it be that the individual, if you even have something to say, if you have something to advertise to draw people's attention to you, let it be the fact that you understand me, you know me, 
and you understand my attributes and my purposes, that I exercise kindness, I display justice and righteousness on earth. He says, for in this I delight. It's phenomenal. So if a person wants to pursue God, then it should be that the person understands God and understands the things that represent his purposes. His purposes include kindness, the display of God's kindness, his justice, and his righteousness upon the earth. If a person understands that, then it is phenomenal. Now, let us quickly also read from Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We will not read all of it, but just because uh, we need it to bolster what we're saying, he says, because that from verse 18, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, verse 19 seems to want to talk about what God was saying to Jeremiah, because that which may be known of God is already <clears throat> revealed in them. I want you to take that. In some passages, they call manifest. That means shown. For God has showed it unto them. So, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and even his eternal power and Godhead. Last phrase, so that they are without excuse. It is phenomenal, uh, these two passages, that God has already revealed himself, and that his desire is for us to know him. But this is what I want to say. This idea of knowing God is one vocation that has people very confused. The reason is simple. A lot of people have presumed that they know God when only what they know is a God of their fantasy. It's, it's, it's all over the place. When push really comes to shove, you want to test the validity of their knowledge. What you discover is that you are seeing the fantasies of these people about a God that they have created themselves, which is one of the reasons when you look at a church, if a problem is going on in the church or before that, they could be having coffee together and bonds and cakes and doing all of these phenomenal things together when it comes to display the kindness, the justice, and the righteousness of God, what you suddenly discover is these people never know God at all. They just enjoy the fantasy of the God that they have created. It's simple. The reason is that there are many bits and pieces of information out there about God. And because a lot of these informations are not tied together to create some form of tangible information, more frustration have arisen as a result of this. A lot of people, the Methodists have their idea of God, the Anglican, the, the Pentecostal, the non-denomination, but it is, not, it is not put together. And so what we end up having is a confusion, except the individual is found in the right position to truly know who this God is. And the most important piece of the information about knowing God, this is what I will let you, let you know, and I'm sure you already know it. The most important information is Christ. Anyone who is not in relationship with Christ cannot know God. I am not saying for somebody to say, well, I belong to Church of the Savior, Church of the Present, or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for you to truly know God, you have to already have a relationship, an intimacy, 
a union, a subjection to the authority of Jesus Christ. He's all in all for you. And, and I think the best way to describe this relationship with Christ is what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, I am crucified with who? Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I will now live, it is Christ living it through me. It's a big deal. So this is what I want you to hear, dear friends. In our pursuit of God and the purposes of God, the, 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 the catalyst for us to be able to pursue God and know his purposes and fulfill the purposes already have to be tied with the fact that we are not the one in charge. We are already dead. Christ is the one living in us. He is the one steering our lives and taking it to wherever he wants to take us. That's the condition. And it is simple because we cannot reach a holy God. We have to go through a holy conduit to get to a holy God, and that is Jesus Christ. It's interesting when John was giving his word, he said, this is the testimony. The testimony that we have been given is that God has given us eternal life. And this life is found in Christ. He who has Christ has eternal life. And he who does not have Christ does not have eternal life. That person has condemned themselves. So this is the trick. For us to truly claim that we know God and we want to pursue him, and fulfill his purpose, it has to come out from our crucifixion to ourselves and the reality of Christ's life leading and directing every step of our life. And I tell you, this is one reason why the love of most people will wax cold as iniquity will grow in this season. It is directly related to the degree to which you are crucified, and the degree to which Christ has control of your life. If he does not have control, the knowledge of God you have is going to be tiny bits and pieces of things that are not put together, and the outcome of it could be a very erroneous confidence that will yield no fruit. And so I really wanted to beat that down so that we start understanding from the beginning. It's not in the church or the relationships I have, but it's in the fact that I am crucified and only Christ now is the one that is living or leading me. It does not matter, hear this, whether you are good or how long you have been in the church or whether you are born again or your dad was a preacher or a missionary. You cannot have a satisfying and a productive relationship with God except you are in relationship. So now you understand that it is not saying, I believe in Jesus. The devil also believes in Jesus. But the scripture says he trembles. Whereas when you have a relationship with Christ, you have been led by him. He takes you to where he wants you to go. And the degree to which he has that control in your life will totally show the fact that you know God. One thing that I want to say, dear friends, is this. People don't study the word of God diligently to show themselves approved. Because it is the word of God that reveals God to us. It is the word of God that brings the spirit of God to us. Unfortunately, as saints and as the church in the 21st century, we are caught with unnecessary distraction. And for this reason, a lot of saints have been derailed in their aspiration to know God. Look, how does a person start? Jesus is Lord, I will die for you. 
they start to manifest in the gifts and the dynamics of the Holy Spirit, and then they hit rock. Well, it is simple. It's because, of course, the gift and the grace of God, they are without repentance. They, they spend energy on those giftings, but they did not spend energy on the gifter. Because if you spend energy on the gifter, he will trim you. That's what he says. I will, he said, I am the, the, the carer for the, for the stem. I cleanse the branches in you that do not bear fruit so that you bear more fruit. That's part of the problem. Meanwhile, the problem is that we have the tendency to concentrate on the fruits. I can heal the sick. I can heal, raise the dead. I can prophesy. I can tell you the number of telephone you have. I can tell you the size of your shoe. These things are good and lofty, but the problem is that it should be in tandem or simultaneous work with the fact that I am being chiseled, I am being trimmed by Christ. And the more I am trimmed by Christ, the more the fruit becomes more authentic because I become more like God. Do you guys remember what happened to Isaiah when he saw the glory of the Lord of hosts? The first thing he saw was what? His uncleanness. That's what happens. When we draw near him, when he's the one chiseling and polishing or trimming us, one of the things that will happen is the glorious presence of his holiness will shine on us. And you cannot be in relationship with him and be the same. He will sanctify you. He will not let you see your weakness just because he's a mean God. It's just who he is. He's holy. When a holy person, an unholy person, as me, draws near to him, his holiness shows me the part of me that needs to be sanctified. And then I am sanctified. Then I can respond to, here I am, use me. Here I am, send me. Here I am, I will stand in the gap. That's the key. So the secret to knowing God is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. One interesting fact is that our soul knows that God is the only person that can satisfy it. This morning, we had a phenomenal praise and worship that says, I want to draw from you. I want to draw from you. You see, our soul knows. Even atheists, the people who write big statements, like we don't need God. Let me not mention their name. Those who spend their life proving that we don't need God. The very reason that they go on that mission is because their soul knows that they need God. Our soul knows. Because he put it inside of us. When he created us, although we have independence, it was not independence of the life of God. It is that life that gave us even the opportunities that we have. And that is why people get passionate when it comes about comes to discussion or things about God, whether for God or against God. People become so passionate. Except that most times, People may be passionate on the wrong side. And this passion, dear friend, has led to so much pain and suffering, all in the name of God. I mean, you guys see the trouble that is going on around the world today. So, but what I want you to see is this. Somebody may say, Pastor Tony, well, you seem to have made some point this morning. But you've also presented the fact that God may be complicated. <laughs> but that's not what I'm trying to say. God is not complicated. Because God already took the initiative to reveal himself. That's what we read in Romans 1. God already took the initiative. Number two, God desires that we know him. That's what we read in Jeremiah 19. He said, if you must boast, boast in the fact that you understand and you know me. Now, but this is the best part of it. God wants us to find him because he has already taken that initiative to make himself known. 
when he was talking to his children, Israel, today we are Israel, so we qualify to appropriate those verses to ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12 to 14. He says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. You will come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found of you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place where I sent you in exile. We're going to come back to this verse, but let me read some other Bible passages just to add to it. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17, just to prove what I already said, it says, I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me can somebody complete that phrase will find me isn't that interesting i love those who diligently who love me and those who diligently seek me they will find me let's read the King James Version. We just read the NASB version. King James says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Isn't that something? It's extremely important. So this is what I want to first of all establish today. The Lord expects us to pursue him. And he did not only say, look for me, and without any direction, he gave us resources to pursue him. One of the things that we need to pursue God, apart from being in Christ, is, guys, if you say, if you, maybe you're, if you follow me, is what, the, what? Diligence. Diligence. That's one of the things. I'm going to put my girl on the, on the stand. I've noticed that when she's preparing for an exam or studying, and I just smile when I pass by, I say she's in a beast mode. That's diligence. Because you cut out everything, you cut out everybody, you cut out every distraction, and sum together all your energy in pursuing that goal. God is saying, cut out distractions, gather your energy, and invest it in pursuing me. That's what God is saying. All the great discoveries in this world, they have never been without a price of diligence. They have never been. If you do not add diligence to what you are doing, you are not going to get results. And God is saying, Add diligence, pursue me diligently, then you will look, you will see me. Let me tell you one secret about diligence. Diligence doesn't work when you have everything working together. You have to eliminate things that are taking your energy, taking your time, taking your concentration, put them together in one and diligently pursue that one goal. That's when you succeed. So what God is saying is this. Eliminate. Subtract. Give up. Tear away. And then put together the purposeful strength and energy to seek after me. That's how you find me. Diligence. Number one. Number two. Seek me. So if you do not have an appetite, well, if God really wants to reveal himself to me, he'll show. God can, definitely. But I want you to see this principle. Can God do without you? 
Do you think God cannot do without you? He can't do without you. Did he exist without you? Has he existed without you? He can. So this is what I want you to see, although it's desire is not to reject his children, but if you don't seek God, you may be fooling yourself because God desires that you seek him. And the reason is very simple. You seek other things that matter to you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If I seek to buy a car, buy a land, and buy a house, and have big business, and have enough money, I seek those things that will make me achieve my goal. How much more would I not seek God? And that's why my excuse to say, well, God, if you really want me to know you, you will come after me. I don't have the answer for that, but I know this. It is my responsibility to seek God. Number two instrument that God showed us, that seeking God is a timely thing. What did I say? Can we just repeat that word? Seeking God is what? A timely thing. It is extremely important. There is a time when you don't have the strength again. There is a time when it will not be profitable to you again. I didn't say that. God said, "Those I love those who love me and those who seek me and seek me early. Because there's a time when those factors can't achieve anything for me again. And there's a time when my search may no longer be valuable. Finally, this search is guaranteed. That's the beautiful part of it all. It's not like, well, it's a gamble. You know, we were watching a fight recently. Somebody gambled so much. He wasn't sure. That's why he gambled. And his gamble didn't pay off. But the idea here is that when you diligently seek God in a timely manner, the search is guaranteed that we're going to find God. He's not playing game with us. And this is why, this is one thing that I want to kind of say about these factors that God gave us. The value that you place upon the pursuit of God will determine the result you get. That value you place on it. Ah, you know, one of the saddest, one of the so many sad stories that one has experienced <clears throat> Life is when we were in mission in Romania, we met a young lady, probably in her late 20s, early 30s, if she's ever even there, a very pretty one. And uh, she gave her life. She was so on fire for God and by herself without being prompted, gave up all the things that she used to do, left all her friends left, you know, a life of drunkenness and debauchery, and then came and said, I want to follow God. And she was an encouragement for everybody. But there was a problem. She did not put the appropriate value on that passion. Because when she ran into the people from her old life, I think they convinced her that she was wasting time. And so in her mind, she was convinced that pursuing God was a wrong business. And she reduced the value from this much to this much. And the consequence of reducing that value was she came directly to me and said, Pastor Tony, I am too young and beautiful. This is my time to enjoy boys. I don't want to be saved now. And she told me, when I am like 40, I can't remember, I may be changing the, the age, but I know she gave me an age. She said, when I'm like 40, when I'm married, I have children, I will be saved. I grieved. I even went to her home. I would pack by the steps so that everybody coming out of the apartment must wake me up. 
just to catch her and beg her. And I caught her and she said, no, she'd made up her mind. And I finally left her. Do you guys want to hear the ultimate consequence of that story? She did not make that Christmas. She didn't make it. She died in an accident. It's terrible. Because, you know, how do you evaluate what really happened? So the, the, the question, the real message that I want to give you with the pursuit of God is that all of these factors may be given to you, but if they don't hold a proper value in the pursuit of God, you will not diligent. You will not be diligent if it doesn't have the right value. And the reason is simple, that people invest in what they want and what they consider important to them. Actually, this is how the Lord Jesus himself sees it. But before we even go there, don't you see, the things that you love, how much you invest in it. If something matters to you, you pursue it. And, and this is exactly the secret for the pursuit of God. That for you to pursue God, you better make sure that it is of a high value to you. Otherwise, you will get tired along the way. You will not invest appropriately. Hear what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21. He says, for where your treasure is, what will happen? Dear, your heart will be also. The things you treasure is what you put your heart upon. And, and, and the New Living Translation puts it like this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. This is important. And the Lord could not have put it better. We as humans, we stare our hearts to the things we consider treasurable, valuable. Even though we know it's going to cost us. Even though we know. Once we consider something a prize, we are usually willing to pursue it. I, I mean, I have never seen anybody who considers something important to them and don't fight for it. People are willing to fight to the death if they consider something of value to them or important to them because they are willing to invest that value in that thing. And so one of the things that you and I need to consider as we pursue God in this rapidly changing landscape of the 21st century, and probably in this 2024, is to evaluate the value of our investments in the pursuit of God. How valuable is it? This is a banal example. When you claim to know God or you want to be God's friends, then the zeal of God is supposed to eat your soul. If you're in the marketplace and people have expletives about God, I see Christians do it every time. Yeah, they're swearing by the name of God and we as saints are around them, but because we do not want to break the relationship we have with them, we go like, <laughs> We laugh, we smile. You know what that says? You value your relationship with the wrong people more than the holiness of God. And maybe none of you listening to me here do that, but I have seen it. I have seen it. Because you see, if it is a thing that I truly value, I draw the line. My relationship with God is not one of the things on my list. My relationship with God is the list. Are you guys following me? It's not one of the things, well, I don't want my mother-in-law to be angry. I don't want my neighbor to think I am a, a what do they call those things, uh, over-religious, uh, uh, zealot. I don't want my neighbors to say that. I don't want them to do this. I have it all on my list. Well, the true list is God. So
So I draw a line. I draw a line because that is my highest value. That is my utmost. I draw that line. Now, that is in my interaction with other people. But this is the key thing. My own interaction with myself, with my conscience, should make God the least. That's the big part. If I'm pursuing God fervently, diligently, in a timely manner, with an assurance that I will find him, then the value that I place upon God cannot depreciate in my own actions that I can judge by myself. Because I can judge my interaction with you or with you and draw the line. But what of my own interaction with my soul that I know about? If I place God as the least, then my interaction with myself, what I desire, what I want, will have tiny little value that has nothing to do with the value that I give to God. It sounds like, is this Christianity 101? Yet that's what Jesus wants. That's number one. Number two, the second reason that people may not truly succeed to pursue this God, or the second reason that we need to pursue this God, is that a lot of people are just spiritually blinded and spiritually influenced. Because once I say blinded, somebody will say, yes, we know people in the world. But the truth is that saints are spiritually influenced. Paul tells me in Ephesians chapter 6 that I am in a wrestling contest, right? But this wrestling, they are not with flesh and blood, but they are with principalities, they are with powers, they are dominions and wickedness in high places. I mentioned it last week, that there are times that we are secretly being influenced by the devil and his agencies. And when we are ignorant of that fact, then the devil takes advantage of us. That's the one part that a lot of saints don't know. I have seen it. When I counsel people, for example, in their marriages, I, I, I can look at all the A, B, C, Ds and X, Y, Z alignment. I know all the things they're telling me is not a problem. They are just being influenced by the demons. But until their eyes are opened, you cannot help them. Relationships that go sour. You have to eat, you have shelter, you have everything you need. Yet something is just not in the place that it should be. And as long as something is not in the place that it should be, your pursuit of God will be compromised. There's something behind it. And that's why Paul wonders. You know what he said? Do not be what? Ignorant. Ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Peter said it in 2 Peter 5.8. He said, be sober. Be awake. For the lion, the devil, roaring like a lion. He didn't say he's a lion. Prowling. A seeking whom to devour. My soberness is what keeps my eyes open. I love one preacher. I'm not going to mention his name because, you know, I'm not here to promote a human being. But he said when he was a new Christian, he thought you need to only worry about big diseases. You know, like you're having, I don't know, protrusion of your stomach and whatever. <laughs> he says, you worry about that. He said, you know, he will have something troubling his eye. He will just say, ah, it's nothing. I won't pray about that. A toothache, ah, that's not a problem. Headache, ah, no. Malaria, I won't even pray. I can use medicine. He said, but what he discovered is that the devil uses those things that he calls soft targets to get to him. He said he realized that. And then if something goes wrong in his eyes for one tiny bit of a second, he said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And you know what happens? The devil don't, doesn't use those instruments again because he knows that the man has discovered 
his trickery. Guys, I want you to hear this. This type of a team can be a huge hindrance in our pursuit of God because they are like little foxes. They distract you. You want to pray, you can. You want to worship, you cannot. You want to go to the left, you can. Although they are not a big deal, but they are distracting you from what is important. And that's why Apostle Paul said, there are times when people cannot see the glorious light of God. Here, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, in whom the God of this world had blinded their minds, of which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The devil does that. You know, he's not going to kind of throw big bombs at you, but he will throw little bombs enough to keep you concentrated on the pursuit of God and the purposes of God. Of course, the other side of this particular story is if you're not in the light anyway, if you're bound by sin and you're a slave to it, the light of the glorious nature of Christ will not shine upon you. And I believe that for us as saints, we must be very careful that like those tiny little itty itty things that we ignore, they are not demonic or satanic manipulation. Let me show you why this is extremely important. You may have a cell phone. You know, today in the world that we are in, we know cell phones are extremely important. They could save your life. You could have a cell phone that can even dial 911. With the way Apple is going, it can sense your problem and call your doctor and your doctor will call the ambulance. But there's one condition. There has to be a tower that relays your message. If there's no tower for the signals to bounce, your telephone is a dud. That's very important. And this is exactly why we need to be careful that the enemy is not quietly blinding us to certain realities of the pursuit of God. Number three, one third problem or third reason why we may not be able to pursue God and his purposes is unbelief. You could say, ah, thank God, he's not talking about me now. That's the people in the world. No. Unbelief is a big reason. And the way unbelief works is not that you are not saved. It's like that this type of unbelief is a conviction that tells you you don't have to be so fervent about God. You don't, I, I actually had a preacher say, you don't need to pray for God to help you have a child or to have a good business. He said, just think. And the reason that person is saying that is that once you are saved, that's enough. Do the rest by yourself. It's because he does not believe. He has not tasted God and see that God is good. And so he has been forced to make a philosophy of his own. The problem with unbelief is this. No matter how you wing it, you're, you are actually saying that God does not exist. Although somewhere along the line, as humans, we want God to intervene in our problem or even show a little bit of display of his power, but because we do not believe to the utmost, we cannot enjoy the fruit of that relationship. Dear friends, what it comes down to is that as saints or unbelievers, we attempt to use God as a tool and dump him. And when we do not get those things from him, we come to the conclusion, well, maybe God is doing it for people. He doesn't have to do with me. Unbelief. You remember, without faith, hear what he says in Hebrews 1, 11, 6. Without faith, 
What is impossible? It is impossible to please God. But anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You must believe. If you start out that God does not exist, then for you, he is inexistent. Well, Pastor Tony, well, you may not be talking about me. I probably, I don't want to talk about you. I pray it's not about you. But this is what I want you to know. Is this. If you believe that God exists, but you don't believe that he's able to utmostly save you, and he's able to deal with certain problems in your life, it's as saying he does not exist. That's, that's what I'm saying. There is no halfway. Well, can God help me pass an exam? Well, wise people will say, read your book and you will remember. That's true. But if you have it anywhere in your mind that he cannot intervene, then you're actually saying he doesn't exist because you're limiting his power. And he's a sovereign God whose power cannot be limited. Romans chapter 3, verse 3 says, what if some were unfaithful? You know, that means what if some don't have faith? Will they not having faith nullify God's faithfulness? If I think God cannot help me with my pinky or my pimples or my need or my familiar stress or whatever it is, does it cancel the fact that God is faithful? It cannot. That's what Paul is trying to say. Simply put, because one person may not believe in God, that does not cancel the fact that God is and he is faithful. You remember when somebody like the Apostle Thomas refused to believe? Other apostles believed when, he told, when they told him that they had seen the Lord. Now, Thomas didn't believe, right? Until he saw the hands of Jesus. But did that change the fact that Jesus manifested? It did not. And this is why we have to be very careful to believe God completely to the end. As I bring the sermon to an end, I want to show you certain verses that truly, truly should teach us to have faith in God as we pursue him. And the reason is God shows himself to us the way we perceive him. In Deuteronomy 32, 20, it says, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be for their forward generation, children in whom there is no faith. Why did God say that? He says, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their ends will be. The reason is simple. He said, because to the pure, I will show myself, myself pure. But to the forward, I will show myself unsavory. You know, if you don't think I am, then I'll show you I am not, so that you feel the consequence of my absence. And this is extremely important in our pursuit of God. In conclusion, this is what I want to say. In the pursuit of God, I have come to the conclusion that God used that word diligence because seeking God is not like magic. It's not like you just open one page, you, oh, God is on this page. You see it right away. Seeking God means I have to pay that price of eliminating and separating from destruction and gathering my strength and focusing on the pursuit. It comes down to this. It will cost me something. It will cost me something. And so I would like to conclude by saying this. Are you willing to pay that price? It's just introduction by the grace of God. We're going to continue uh, this teaching. But I think for this week, there's so much that we can meditate upon 
as in the vidwa. Are you willing to pay the price to pursue God? Because if you do, you will be a fruit. May the Lord bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen.